الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to our viewers from Hormaka TV My name is Shukri Gutcher I'm your host this evening uh, Today we have decided to do uh, some activities around civic engagement since the uh, municipal elections are approaching us on October 22nd Please go out there and vote and as an encouragement for the voters we are facilitating today uh, a debate uh, within Ward 1 school trustee candidates um, just um, as uh, some of the stuff that went down behind the scenes, we have extended the invitation to all 10 candidates of Ward 1 and three have accepted. Uh, today we have two of the candidates for Ward 1 school trustee that are running. Uh, the third one um, just excused himself last minute that some things have come up. Without further ado, I want to introduce you, uh, your candidate, uh, uh, Ms. Pad Barar. Of, of uh, she's running for school trustee north of Etobicoke Ward One, and also Ali Muhammad Ali, who's also running for Ward One school trustee. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Homework TV. Uh, as a debate, the questions will be the same for both of you. Uh, you can address them, your voters directly. We want to give you this opportunity um, to inform them better about about you as a candidate and why they should vote for you and um, also about three minutes for, for each answer. So um, just going into it, uh, Pat, could you please introduce yourself a little bit to our viewers, um, why you decided to run and what inspired you to run for school trustee? Thank you, Shukri. Uh, my name is Pat Brar. I'm a candidate for the Toronto District School Board trustee position in Ward 1 North Etobicoke. I'm a parent, and uh, one of the reasons that brought me to this stage for running in the election is the fact that I have two children in the board, and I've been on parent council for a couple of years, and I've heard some of the concerns of parents in the school board, in our school and other schools, and I wanted to be that voice for parents to be able to take their concerns forward. On a smaller level, I've been doing that, taking the concerns of parents to um, the principals of the schools. I felt that it was important to take that next step to be able to help each other um, and to be able to have a voice um, at the table for all our parents that are in the community. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pat. Uh, Ali, uh, same question. What inspired you to run for school trustee? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for Hormark uh, TV for inviting um, all the trustees for this debate. And I'm actually honored to be here um, to speak with you uh, about the uh, the upcoming election in October 22nd. Uh, to come back, and I, I, wel I welcome Pat to as well putting her hat into that because we needed the voice of the community. Um, so I'm glad uh, that you put your name on forward. Um, what inspired me the most was basically is that a number of years ago, um, my, when my first son went to school. Um, teachers asked me, you know, can you help us out at the school? Uh, so I got to the school to help us out in terms of, you know, um, sometimes translating for parents, sometimes talking to the students, and sometimes um, trying to bring more parents to the school to come in, because the schools always love to have parents on board with them so they can educate their children. Um, so as we moved forward, um, you will see needs after needs. So, uh, um, so I have seen the needs of uh, as a parent to get involved and in all of the things. So I try to make an impact. So what happened is that since then, I, I, I get involved about uh, at least uh, five schools. I became the co-chair and the school council member. And then and in Etobicoke North, I represented the ward. I mean, the ward uh, council is basically based on all the schools in Etobicoke North, and then you select or elect two people to represent you at the, at, the, uh, at the TDSP level, where all the parents across the city of Toronto will address the issues. And my priority basically was, is that involved, is that to ensure parents have voice. And I also had another uh, hat that I played with, uh, I, that I was putting all the time, which is make sure our students succeed in the school board. Make sure our school stu students are getting best education. Make sure our teachers are getting resource required. But as you m may know, you will hear a lot from the Toronto District School Board that we don't have enough funds to put 
classroom uh, resources like computers, books, and resources. So one of the, the, the things was to ensure that board allows every school to have what's necessary. Not every school is equal. So what inspired me basically is that one thing, and I just can add to that, when I was growing up, young boy, um, as you can see, I walk with two canes. I don't hide that, by the way, just to let you know. I do not hide, I work with two canes. As my father told me, and he said, you know, Ali, you understand, you cannot be somebody who uh, do, uh, he actually used old English, and he said, you cannot load or unload lorry, it means a big truck. You can't go downstairs and pick up the truck and fill it up. And he said, make sure you use your brain and your mouth and your hand. In other words, make sure you got a better education. So from that day on, um, when I was even a little, a little child, I was very good in the Quranic school when I was a little kid. And the reason was that because I put a lot of effort on it. So the, uh, what transpired me is that it goes back all the way, uh, but also seeing the needs of our communities in North Vitobico. Um, we have a very diverse communities, very different needs sometimes. Sometimes all the parents, what they want is their student to succeed. Sometimes what every parent to dream on, what their kid to go to a higher education. So that actually, um, I, co I consider education as equalizer for everything else. So that's Thank what transpired so me. Thanks, Annie. Thanks for that answer. Um, now, uh, Pat, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, do you live, are you a resident of Ward 1? And also, uh, you have answered in the past, like, do you have kids that attend those schools? I am a resident of Ward 1. I live here uh, near you guys. This is a familiar area for me when we shop at this plaza <laughs> weekly. Um, I'm at Royal York and St. Phillips, and uh, we've been in the area for about 15 years. I grew up in West Toronto, so uh, Dufferin and Lansdowne area. Um, that's where my upbringing is. I'm born and raised there. Um, we moved here uh, after uh, we got married to be closer to my husband's family and to be closer to my parents uh, so that we can provide them support and nice. henceforth have support for ourselves as well. Um, and we do have two children that go to the school board um, at Valleyfield School. That's very good, very good, thank you. So you, you are extremely familiar with the area, uh, you live here, you have kids that attend school, so that, that's, that's a really good thing. Uh, Ali, same question, do you live within Ward 1 and do you have yeah. skill, school, I mean kids that too uh, do attend schools within the Ward Yeah, um, I live in Ward 1, I've lived in Ward 1 most of my life when I'm here in Toronto, um, um, as you know. Um, I live different places within and Ward 1 in Tobico North, whether it's Dixon and Kipling, whether it's Albion and Islington. I, I have never moved around from the area, so that's where I live, that's where my, uh, I grew, uh, my kids grow up. That's where the, most of my kids actually were born, and they go to schools from uh, Kingsview to Braeburn to Elms to Boys Leadership Academy and to the Thistleton Collegiate, which I graduated from. So okay. my high school was also within and Ward 1. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I want to ask you about a plan. If, if you guys have, um, I'm going to start with Pat. Do you have a plan for transportation or increasing transportation for areas that don't have accessibility or walkability and also safety within the school buses? So it, uh, it's something that's come up recently that uh, school buses should have seat belts. Yes. Um, I'm encouraged by that. I think the Ministry of Transportation needs to look at um, the avenues to make that a safe, viable option for students. Um, and uh, certainly, I'm, I'm on board with that. My children take the bus every day. Um, so do the, a lot of the parents in our area. Um, and there's a large bus transportation service um, community in this area. So to encourage and increase that so that more students are able to access those services and more parents are able to feel comfortable that they can get to work knowing that their kids are safely getting to school is very important. Everything we can do to help parents be able to sustain an income mm -hmm. and support their families, I'm, I'm all for. I think it's important um, and critical these days to have a bus transportation for children. Um, I know that we leave for work very early in the morning ourselves and it is helpful to know that there's a, there's a bus that comes and picks them up and because we can't be there at the time that school opens, yeah. that they will be there, they will reach there on time. Um, most importantly, I think safety, the drivers being trained 
is important and um, also to have routes that make sure that the students don't stay on the bus for a very long time. So making sure there's enough buses and the routes are um, planned in a way that they don't have to go way out of their catchment area or away from their home in order to get back. You know, and, and I think that was a very big issue this, uh, in the beginning of this year at school. It's usually in the beginning of the year and then parents will let the principal know, we let principals know, these are the troubles we're having and then, we, and then hence they have to uh, speak with the transportation department to try to get a better situation for children. Um, you don't want any parent waiting 40 minutes at a bus stop yeah. for their child to show up. Um, you certainly don't want any child to get, end up on the wrong bus. Those type of things do happen and I, I really want to work on making sure that we can correct those issues. Thank you. Those are very important points. Ali, same question. Uh, safety on school buses. Uh, I remember sending my older son, uh, four years old at the time, he was very small, mm -hmm. and I was terrified to put him on the school bus because there's no seat belts. Yeah. So those are some of the things, concerns that parents do have. And still until today, there's no seat belts on the school buses. Yeah, seat belt has been uh, an issue for a while right now. And I'm, I'm glad that it actually is becoming timely right now because the issue actually came last two days. It came out about the seat belt and what to do with it. So let me go back to uh, uh, the school bus. I don't know, most of, most of us might know. If you live within two kilometers, you're not going to get bus. Like, so if you live like a next, like a two kilometers, less than two kilometers, you're not going to get bus. So you could be the same thing. Um, what does that do to, um, I remember when my son used to go French immersion school um, uh, at the El Mali, um, we have to take him in the early in the morning to Braeburn to mm -hmm. be bused to go to uh, there or to get by there. So I understand the frustration that parents go through. So what, what is the issue here? The issue here is about the resources. Do we have enough resources for the buses? Do we have enough buses to get there or enough transportation methods? So one thing that you, you will be 100% sure that when I, if I get elected uh, this on, on October 22, that I'll advocate is that to ensure every child who, ha who, is, who lives within reasonable area to be, um, to, to be bused and they get there also on time. Um, I know there's a lot of issues the last few years about transportation and uh, I actually do have some personal experience. I worked in a part-time in transportation sector, so a student going to a wrong bus, ending up in you know, downtown or Scarborough, wow. but is supposed to go somewhere else in, uh, in, in the, I, I, the complexity and what that brings to the parent in terms of the fear, how you're going to be um, um, feeling. The other thing also you want to look at it, uh, at it is that the, um, I'm, my understanding is that the transportation in the city of Toronto, for the Toronto District School Board, they have a, um, a, it's called the, it's a team, there's about five companies, um, uh, five companies, transportation companies, which I'm very happy to see a lot of our communities work, especially mothers in the morning when I see them, when I'm going to work, I see all these mothers driving these buses. And the, when, so to ensure that we have enough resources for students, um, just to add one more thing, um, is that I went um, a few years ago, 2013, I had an opportunity to go in Finland, Helsinki. Finland is known to be one of the best countries in terms of education. So some of us were very cur uh, curious to know what do they do different than us? What do they actually have? And what was amazed me, it was some of the resources they put into education. Wow. A lot of money to the education. Kids will not have to worry about breakfast. They will have a hot breakfast. Kids will not worry about transportation. They have a amazing public transportation. Kids will not have to worry about uh, be, all that stuff. So as a Canadian, as a Torontonian, we know we live in a country that's really rich in terms of resources. There is money for a lot of these things. But when it comes to the cuts, that's where it's usually cut. It's mm -hmm. education, healthcare. So, if I'm elected on October uh, 22nd, that I will be a strong advocate uh, for, uh, for better transportation and for to also to ensure we have a lot of resources in our classrooms. I know the teachers will understand this because it's, if you've got a tired child coming off the bus, you're sure they're not going to be learning today. Absolutely. You know that. Um, and if the parents are worried about the kids, whether they're going to come home safe, or they can get to school on time, you know the learning process is going to be identical. So I'll be very, very, um, um, uh, uh, to be very pleased to know that I will be on your side as a parent um, to work on this issue to resolve. And I think it's an issue that we all care about uh, to, uh, to make sure that safety. And safety is the first about anything to Absolutely. do with education. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, 
basically, I'm glad you brought it to Thank you. Um, I'm glad you brought up the, the budget situation. So uh, in September, when kids were returning back to school, there was uh, the, the indigenous curriculum was, was paused. The indigenous curriculum was paused. I want to know what's your take on that. So the provincial government stated it's because of uh, funding towards that kind of program. We know we're sitting on indigenous land and we will not have the opportunity today to speak about those things. And, and there's a lot of issues that do face the communities within the indigenous people. So um, I, I attended schools here in Toronto, uh, the TDSB, and there was no any there's not there was not sufficient education talking about indigenous issues and or even history, the, indig the indigenous people's history. So what is your take on, on this program that got passed? I want to start with Pat. So what I would like to uh, point out is that uh, the history of uh, any country um, is essential to the future of that country. Mm -hmm. And if we in our schools are not teaching our children um, about our roots, about what, um, where this land came from, who were the original people of this land, then we are doing a disservice to our children. We are not giving them the foundation they need in order to learn and know um, their background, their, um, their roots, um, the history of their country, um, and the culture of their country. Um, we are a multicultural society. We take a lot of time to teach our children about where we came from yes. um, or what our background is. And it's sad that we don't teach our children where, the, where this land came from, who belonged to this land, and how we came to be here, how we built our houses here, how we are now living here. And it, it's, it's an injustice to uh, the indigenous population. It's an injustice to our children as well. So I would, I would encourage the government to go forth with that curriculum because I think it's going to provide a lot of uh, resources, information for our children. And it's also going to give them a sense of pride to know that they know what Canada is all about. They also know what their own family history is all about. My, I see that we teach children uh, their family tree. We talk about where did your grandparents come from? What language do they, did they speak? What is your family history? But we don't talk about before uh, the before we started having a democratic process in Canada, what was the history? We talk about World War I, we talk about mm -hmm. World War II to our children, but we don't talk about how this land was achieved and how this country came to be, how these provinces united. Um, we talk about um, the history after um, the provinces and confederation. We don't talk about the before colonial. the colonial times. We don't talk about those things that are really important to take forward um, by our children. It, they're the, our future generations. They're the ones that are going to take forward all this information and disseminate it to the world, especially in this age of technology. It's really, really important that they have a sense of pride and ownership of where they live. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Um, I'll, I'll pass it to Ali. Please stick within the three minutes. Okay, I will try We've to stick with You've been timed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so what we're looking at the issue is the, um, for the original uh, people of this land that who actually welcomed everybody um, when they, nobody else was here around it. I remember going to grade nine history and think first, first thing I learned, I remember, um, if the, I know there's a teacher among us, it was Jack Cartier. Um, and how Montreal became Montreal, and how Canada became Canada. And, and the name Kanata was, uh, the, you know, the British or English speakers couldn't pronounce Kanata, so they pronounced it's Canada, Canada yeah. or it's going to be in you know, Mont Royal or Montreal and all that stuff. So what we're looking at to the um, um, acknowledging an Aboriginal people first in this country is obligation on us, as they share with a lot, a lot with uh, different communities in this, in this uh, great province and this great, and this great world, which is, you know, deep culture. So what we're looking at is something called the cultural competency. 
uh, another word, putting resources in the classrooms where teachers actually could um, understand uh, every single student, uh, regardless of where their background, whether they're Aboriginal or whether they're new immigrant or whether they're the dominant culture, that they, they, what are the needs they have for that. So uh, for sure, I will be supporting Aboriginal and Indigenous um, decolonization and empowerment. This is absolutely the just cause to do so. And what do we look at? So, so it goes back to a lot about resources. So most of you may know the province controls the curriculum and the resources. So 95% of the money that comes to the Toronto District School Board comes from the Ministry of Education. So that comes with the restrictions, where to go and how to spend and where to spend. So as a trustee, if I'm elected, elected on, Octo uh, on October 22nd, I will be um, advocating for, um, and I clearly put it on my brochure, that we're looking for inclusive society, society that reflects its own. Um, the, 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 um, the, the face of city of Toronto changed since I even came. A lot has changed. So understanding of different cultures and different uh, languages, historically, um, actually I went to Winnipeg. My first experience with uh, deeply in Aboriginal was when I went to Winnipeg for work. And I do see it in my first hand how the Aboriginal people are marginalized. We have seen it in Toronto, but that was more clear to me. So I will be supporting for a curriculum that includes um, Aboriginal um, um, the curriculum that reflects on the history of the people who are here, you know, whether the whether different tribes of, uh, of, uh, of Aboriginals, whether the Inuit, whether, whether different things like that, because there is a lot that we share. The other thing that we have to go back to is that, yeah, we want to pressure the province. We want to pressure the province to put more resources in, in the classrooms, the curriculum to be more reflective of the student that is receiving the education, and the student to be the first. Because here we want to educate and student inclusively, understanding and well-rounded from all the angles that the society needs, not only for labor market, it's also for understanding the communities that we live, how we be outside. So you will see an inclusivity and accessibility of, uh, is actually one of my key points that we want to achieve that also uh, includes also, uh, beside Aboriginal people, includes people of color, because I know maybe you will come to that point, that students of color are really marginalized in our schools. So we need to look at that equally to the to the Aboriginal uh, uh, curriculum. So um, I would say I would conclude saying I'm 100% on board and inclusive and just society for all so students. So that basically both of you the consensus is uh, the Aborig uh, Indigenous Indigenous people's people. curriculum should go forward at least in Ontario, yes. right? Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, that was a good input. Um, we know that there's a lot of legislations are going through right now. Uh, around c cannabis and um, legalizing marijuana. So tomorrow on Wednesday, October the 17th, marijuana, cannabis will be legal everywhere in Canada. So that's countrywide, not just necessarily the province of Ontario. So my question is, having those information, I know the Toronto Police Department have some sort of like um, an outline on policies that impact their employees and their staff within and different other departments have been doing that. Uh, is there a plan in place to reduce harm? Because we know adolescents already do abuse uh, and, or use. Uh, so I wanna start with Ali. Uh, is there a plan to reduce harm or for safety of these adolescents? Thank you. So the issue of, uh, of legalization marijuana, so there's a two sides of every story. So there's an issue that uh, people will look at it, and I know because of um, a number of people that I know who happen to have a disability. So there is a medicinal side. Uh, where the, a lot of advocacy went to, into and to cure uh, or, or relieve pain such as MS, um, such as epilepsy, and if you, uh, those of you who may understand that subject is that there are some medicinal benefits to a lot of uh, people who need them. And there's a lot of harm which, which the you know, youth get used to it and it's going to become addiction, how you balance it. Unfortunately, I should admit this one, this is coming from uh, federal government and the province already passed uh, the law that they will be selling in the particular areas, I think it's online order so only we know, we know we so what we could back, do what we but, could do yeah. what we could do is that is, is that it, sometimes you have to stand on a policy I was a student, I'm a student of public policy so sometimes if you cannot stop the issue you minimize the harm mm -hmm. so for example I would not have no issues that the same if there is no medicinal benefit and there's no uh, medical field justified in an, a, a, an individual should consume in particular place it should be away from school zones first just so the students who don't understand do not fall into that 
um, and, and, and addiction is also a mental health it's in connection and it's also connected with a lot of um, disabilities so we got to be balanced so what I'm going to be looking at is the evidence mm -hmm. data-based evidence that is a clear scientifically rooted not politically uh, driven it's like oh I'm, 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 I'm legalized marijuana so everybody's gonna smoke pot and will elect me tomorrow it's not like that we look at the data the benefit and analysis and also reducing the harm so it's gonna be a lot of cost so and and it's all because my, my question Ali is about harm reduction harm we reduction. already know we cannot take it back yeah. it is going to be legal from tomorrow yeah so it should be stay away from the school zones completely and okay. my in so my in my view that you're and, push yeah, yeah. unless it's justified by the medical and there's a that support that individual needs for medicinal purposes that is a human right case that is the need base for students that you cannot stop Okay, okay, thank you so much. Pat, same question. Uh, what do you think about marijuana legalization and basically since it's becoming legal, uh, is there any plan that you had in mind to put in place for schools to reduce harm? Well, at this point, uh, opinions on whether it should be legal or not legal are not uh, of concern or relevant, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it is going to be legal as of tomorrow, October the 17th. Uh, what we need to do is make sure that we have some clear boundaries set for our school zones um, and that people that do distribute marijuana illegally are held to account still, right? Uh, so if this is an online process, people can access this service with providing information and documentation, that's okay. But then them selling it to other people is where the issue will become a concern for our youth. 18 or under, it's not consumable and it's not for you anyway. Okay, so the law is saying 18 and over, we won't hold you uh, to account in the way that you'll be charged, you'll have a criminal record because you were found with some marijuana. But that doesn't mean the health hazards have gone away. That doesn't mean the health benefits to some have gone, you know, changed. So it's a very complex issue. Mm -hmm. I, I do believe that there's a lot, a lot of resources and information and studies that show that it's harmful to children under the age of 18 uh, because their brains are still developing. And I would push that we make sure that our children's schools are safe and that they're not uh, getting hold of product that might not be safe for them. Um, and uh, certainly cutoff areas is good, but it's gonna be very hard to police that now. So educating our children is just as essential. Our youth should know the harms and the benefits, okay? Um, and like Ali mentioned, medical reasons that justify, just, such as epilepsy or MS, is takes a long time there's doctors involved there's yes. specialists involved there's to get to that stage you've gone through many many processes so educating our children and our youth especially that you know in order for this to be a medicinally beneficial thing there's a process to be had but if you're going to use this as a recreational um, product then there are some harms to it there are there are maybe more harms than benefits to it at times because you may not know where the product is coming from, how, um, how catered that is to your needs um, or where, where that came from. Absolutely. So th th that education is, I think, it's where key. we need to be For right sure. Now. Thank you so much, Pat. So um, the hot topic and the discussions and the debates around uh, sex ed with the physical education uh, that the liberal government, uh, Kathleen Wynne's government, imposed on us, right? Uh, that has been revoked by the current provincial government of Doug Ford. My question to you is, do you agree with the steps? And if you agree or disagree, and why? I'm gonna start uh, with you, Pat. Okay, um, so I think that uh, the fact that it's been revoked uh, gives us an opportunity to go back to the table and understand what the views of all the stakeholders are. And I think the concern parents had was that there wasn't enough consultation with parents. And they had concerns, valid concerns, that they wanted to raise. Uh, I'm a parent. I believe I understand my children better. Okay, so 
some, in, some uh, information I would introduce to my older child, probably maybe at a later age, and maybe to my younger child at an earlier age, depending on their personality. And I think that determination is up to parents, when the information and how much information should be dispersed. But having that said, sex ed curriculum and health education have gone hand in hand for years. It's just the amount of information has changed. We never had an issue with that. Parents didn't seem to have an issue with that before. I think the problem is the information and how much information is being given now. And I think it's a good thing that they're going back to the table to get that consultation done. Unfortunately, I find that it's such a waste of money. They should have done this way before. Because if they had gone about it the right way, they would have had the board level, the government would have had this nipped in the bud and handled properly and we would have a curriculum that was okay for parents, okay for educators, okay for the government, okay for the students, right? And I think if we do something, we shouldn't be making mistakes, especially when it's uh, about our children, yeah. it's about our future, okay? Absolutely, thank you so much, Pat. Um, Ali, uh, Doug Ford's government uh, revoked the sex ed and he's being applauded to do so by a lot of especially religious group and because we know the the biggest argument is maybe too much too soon and as, as a concern as you know we come from a Muslim community uh, and any group of uh, beliefs or religion beliefs certain cultures right so maybe there's misinformation that's being put out there what do you think and what is your idea do you agree with uh, Doug Ford's provincial decision of provoking, revoking the curriculum, or do you uh, disagree, and why? So uh, my understanding is that the actually it doesn't the, the subject doesn't call sex education. People made yeah. that up. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's called the physical and health physical. education, and it's yeah. being, being part of the uh, education system, particularly when the kids go to grade six level up to there. It's trying to understand the property, trying to understand who they are, biological change. That's how it began into it, and then it became a political dynamo. Somebody, people make uh, made a mega, mega even bigger than that it is. For this particular subject, um, we know the communities across the city have a different views, and there are a lot of parents who worry about it. We experience a lot of parents who took their children from classrooms for with uh, with Allah, and we because we've seen the political right putting information that is not necessarily the accurate what is in there. So it's there is a lot. So what we need to do here is to take a middle ground, to look at the, what the data shows, to look at the, what the parents' view are. And on top of that, I think I'm personally comfortable with the teach, let the teachers teach. Because we have a very well knowledgeable teachers in the classrooms who know firsthand their student, who know the community they live in, who can just adjust the curriculum to the, way, the needs of the community locally. So in Etobicoke North, for example, if you go to a particular school, what, what's the problem with leaving that to the teachers? Because the teachers see the parents every day, they understand, they are part of our community. So in a summary, I would argue, let the teachers teach. Um, a lot of the arguments that came with that though was that the teachers were not trained enough and they were not given the resources that made them well equipped to teach. Absolutely. Pat's point of being a parent, every parent knows their child. Absolutely. Right? Uh, because this subject is taboo regardless, right? Um, but a lot of the, the information that are coming from, like you said, the media or other outlets were not as correct or, or accurate. But let the teachers teach what in particular? So, for example, the teachers usually have, <laughs> teachers have a lot of um, discretionary teaching. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you live in a particular community, you understand the community's needs in that area. You know them, what the needs are, you know what they are sensitive to it. So teachers do understand. They do that in everything. They do that in math. They do that in English, they do that in phys ed. That's why we have a boys phys ed, sometimes a mix, sometimes not mix. So the one way of saying that is that because we know when the teachers live in the neighborhood, they know their community together. So here's what, you need to, what people need to understand. Number one, when issue becomes politicized, you would not gonna get enough information. So what the data shows is that, so a lot of people will come and argue, so is that the data argues that there are protections that need to be extended to the, uh, to, uh, for, particular, for the children who is from LGB community, how are we gonna, so how are we gonna protect from bullying? Bullying. Yeah. Uh, so, so the mix of bullying 
with a particular subject, it becomes totally different. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and where are you going to need for service? Example, if you have a student, a minority student in particular schools, how you protect the, 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 the minority school while you uphold the rights of the majority? So that's what I'm saying to the, the, let the, let the team. So we wanted the governments and any government to be off this particular areas and allow, because the teachers are and the parents are the first educators. I know when my kids were going to school, I used to get a letter and from home saying, oh, particular day, that day, we're teaching X, Y, Z class, would you like to give us a consent, your child to participate or not to participate, mm -hmm. or would you like your child to be excluded or not? You know, we all, we all got to those kind of amendments. And it was, we didn't see any problem, but when it becomes shuffling to people through, and the other time it's people coming. So I don't want the political right or political left to use this as a campaign for political scoring. Mm -hmm. um, we, we look into the data, we look, show, look what the research is saying, we look into the, with the, with the, uh, the, uh, the security and the police who shows up, children and what they invite. So, and then that what we're saying, well, let the teachers teach means a teacher lives in the community, knows their community, mm -hmm. they can adjust the curriculum based on the needs, wants, and expectation of the, their students and their parents. Okay, uh, I want to thank you both. Yeah. I have a point. Uh, well, sure, sorry. sure. I'm Pat. so sorry no uh, to cut in. Uh, I think it's important to let teachers teach, but I think it's really, really important to give those teachers some strict guidelines. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot teachers can teach. And I, I encourage teachers. I, I'm a product of the Toronto District School Board, so I know that uh, teachers have the best interest of their students. but. You want to make sure that they also know what is acceptable for what age group. And that's why the curriculum is really, really important. The, those boundaries are very important. And you know what? My children are learning in school right now, and I don't get a letter at home. I only find out when my child comes home and tells After me. And happen. that should never happen. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just add to one point is that basically, when we're, uh, as I say in many times, um, um, it comes back to a lot of times the resource. So we're talking about mm -hmm. the resource in the classroom. What kind of resource the teachers have so they can produce the best educated children? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and how much research to put, put into class. But if you put in like a half an hour, an hour a particular activity and the teachers are limited, then you're only going to produce a very limited. But I also keep in mind yeah. that we're talking about TDSB here. Yeah. So oversized so classrooms. It's a huge. The teachers yeah. are bombarded with a lot of things. They have to deal with the principal, the parents, the kids, and everything students. in between. Yeah. So we have to keep those things in mind Balance. and what kind of resources that knowing need. that the province keeps cutting and cutting, cutting yep. and some buildings have mold in them since I was attending school, so Absolutely. let alone today. Yeah. And so we need to keep all these things in mind. Absolutely. This, I'm going to be honest with you because it's yeah. sex ed. Okay, so let's say physical and health education. That's what it's called, actually. That's the title for it. Yeah. But I mean, the, the sex ed gets more attention because A that's lot. what uh, people are trying to fight. It's right a political dynamic. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So um, it's for some people, it's uh, on elections day on October 22nd, yeah. it's like make it or break it. Yeah. They want a clear, not the politically charged answer. Yeah. Uh, and I don't want to push you to say something or put words in your mouth, but they just want a clear, yeah. are you for it or you're against it? Um, I think I, do, I, I think at this stage I don't have enough um, um, evidence to go against or to go forth. And I think what we're looking at here is that the province took it back and said we're going to consult with the, with the parents. So what kind of consultation that happens, I think we should have to, have to look at it. Yeah. I haven't seen anything come to me yet okay. that tells me, Ali, where you think and where it's going to be. And when the other one was done, nobody come to me and say, where are you going to be standing in it? So what we look at is that unless we have, we want to make an informed, informed decision. decision. And right, right now the data that we have is mm -hmm. politically charged. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Pat, do you want to close that? Um, I think the most important thing is no matter where they end up, as the Toronto District School Board Trustee for Ward 1, our job is to take forth your voice. Whatever your concerns are, whatever the parents and the constituents, whether they're students that are over 18 that are able to vote, or whether you're parents or grandparents, it's your opinion that we have to take forth and say, you know, this is what our constituents are saying. I'm not sure what your consultations are, but this is the input we're getting. And to and take, take that forward. forward. Yeah, take that Absolutely. forward. Okay. Thank you so 100%. much. I want to thank you both. And also, I want to open the question for audience members. Uh, we can take up to three questions. You can address an individual candidate uh, or you can address both candidates. Thank you. I would like to ask one question both. Both, yeah. okay. Uh, what do you recommend the, if the government has now the, the sex educational 
system. And they are going to back 1998. Do you think that is worthwhile, or do, do you think the 2015 is worthwhile? Do you want me to go for it? Sure. Yeah. yeah, so thank you very much. That's a great question. It's, I mean, it's a very great question. Thank you for that. The problem is, um, trustees level, um, as I indicated before, the province has the power of uh, legislating and the, the trustees' voice is, as Pat was mentioning, is to take the community voices. But they don't, the trustees don't make those kind of decisions when it comes to the curriculum, when it comes to the bigger policy, the ministry. So what happens is that there are political back and forth. Some people will take to that, some people push to that forward. It's a political um, a, a environment. So what that does, does it confuses parents uh, like us and you and everything else. So whatever, they, they, nobody consulted to us and told us, okay, where should we take it? Should we take 60s, 70s? Should we take it to 2020 forward? Uh, but is that this, the government did, the liberal did this one, now conservatives gonna do this one. So I think we gotta be very look at it, say, in education, what are we looking for? We're looking for well-informed, well-educated students that are, can compete in today's society in terms of technology, STEMs, and everything else, and we're not hearing that enough of that. Thank you. Hi. I, I think uh, 98 would probably be a little too far because there's many health changes. There's changes to uh, diseases and illnesses, and there's also changes to uh, the rights and, um, of our country. So the LGBT community, uh, two-spirited community rights. Um, so you have to take all that into account. And I think certainly we need to make some changes. What those changes look like is very important. Um, so uh, even though we don't get to decide that, even though uh, I'm not the one making that decision, it's the government, it is important that I take your voice and say, you know what, this is what my constituents are saying. They feel that, yes, um, 98 sh should be allowed or no, they want 2015 or maybe they want something in between. Whatever that is, unless I take that forward, um, then it isn't taken into account, right? And I think the most important thing is to be able to have that say, to be able to say, you know what, I agree with this or I don't agree with this. I, I personally believe we have to have something a little bit in the middle. Right? And uh, maybe um, not so much the curriculum isn't the problem, it's the age at which it's introduced might be the problem. Yeah. And those are the things we need to look at. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, any more questions from the audience? If you live in Ward 1... I any wars students? Students? Any wars? Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, we're all good. I want to thank everyone for attending and exercising your civic duty and civic rights. Uh, like I said in the beginning, the aim from Home Market TV is to be a well-informed voter. I want to thank both Ali and Pad for taking the time to addressing their voters. And I can tell you both do care about Word 1 and the students and the parents of Word 1. I want to give each one of you a two-minute closing remark. And in that, also address why should people vote for you. I'm going to give it to Pat first. Okay. Uh, I think uh, first and foremost, it's the experience and the background. Uh, I know that uh, we've had a lot of time here speaking today, um, and we haven't touched a little bit on my background. I have a social services background, and I work with addictions, mental health, homelessness, and unemployment. I've been doing that in a shelter setting for 18 years, and I go to the hospitals for the Ministry of Health and speak to patients in the mental health wards. So I've seen a huge increase in the amount of crime, addictions, and mental health in our youth, and I want to make sure that we have the appropriate resources and the appropriate information and engagement so we are talking to our youth we're getting them involved and we have enough youth leaders in our programs to encourage them to stay with us throughout their education and have a healthy education process um, whether it's bullying or depression anxiety these are things that are now uh, plaguing our children and I I want to be able to be the solution for that I want the parents and their concerns to be addressed um, that's the reason I'm running and my experience and background I believe is appropriate for this job and uh, and most importantly I feel that 
I have the ear to listen and the voice to speak on your behalf. Thank you so much. Thanks, Pat. Uh, yeah, thank Ali? yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And I think the question is coming to that, why we elect you as a, as a trustee for October 22. So I'm going to make it very, I'll summarize it because this is the end of it. Um, for me, it's a natural. I've been volunteering from Toronto District School Board as a parent in the last seven, eight years. So it became a very natural. I believe education is equalizer. That's why I went to finish my, when I finished my high school, I make sure that I can attend university, pay my own university without going to debt, and which I'm very proud of it. I have a master's degree in public policy, so I do understand how you formulate policy, how you, how you implement policy, and how you evaluate the policy to see what the intended purpose was. Um, and I live in the world, I do have my children go to the schools in here. So for me, it's giving back to the community. Um, I think um, this country gave me a great opportunity to be who I am in terms of security, safety, education, and, and an opportunity to uh, practice what I believe or what I stand for. So my, again, why you want to elect me in October 22? Three things. When you're electing trustee, you need to look at three things. Knowledge, skills, and experience. I combine all three compared to 10, compared to all the trustees that are running for here. And the other thing that I'm doing is that I practice this without being a trustee uh, in, in, within the last few years. I've been helping trustees. I worked with the three trustees. It was a, John Hastings, Michael Ford, and Aftar Minhas. All of them, I was their parent rep. So for me, it's a natural. What else is in here in, is in, in, in the stick on, on October 22nd? If, when I go to the board, I don't need to learn how the board work. I already know how the board work. I work with that. I pass motions. I put motions forward through trustees and implement it to help students forward. So giving back experience. So I would say, I highly recommend you in October 22, you look at the person's skills abilities and education and experience and I combine for that and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. So our viewers, uh, that was a debate of uh, school trustee candidates of Ward 1. We do uh, appreciate and thank uh, Pat Barar and Ali Muhammad Ali for, for coming and taking the time. Um, our aim again is to have a more, more well-rounded, more well-informed voter so as parents who cares about your kids and their future within the school system go out there and vote on october 22nd now i just want to announce one thing october is somali heritage month within the tdsb and um on thursday october 25th uh, there's going to be an event at kipling collegiate it's going to start at 5 30. Uh, you can come out there and we'll share the flyer on our social media outlet Thank you so much for watching. Signing off, Shukri Gutcher, Toronto, Hormarka TV. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ali. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Look at TV.